we are definitely living in a time where you know reality is seems to be stranger than fiction and sometimes when you turn on the news or you're just watching a reality show it feels like you know it's an episode of veep or it's a sketch on saturday night live so we have one question today is anything funnier than politics <laughs> we're bringing together three talented authors whose new books will make you laugh out loud at our political landscape please welcome to the national book festival susan call who is the author of bookish people Grant Ginder, the author of Let's Not Do That Again. <laughs> and Sochio Gonzalez, the author of Olga Dies Dreaming. <laughs> Welcome to the three of you. Let me get this started. So, I, I just said it, like, what makes politics so darn funny? Or is the better question, what makes Washington so funny? <laughs> we'll start with you, Grant. We were just chatting here that you worked on Capitol Hill, so you must have some stories. I did, I did. So I, I interned on Capitol Hill um, when I was in college, obviously. Then after that, I went to work at the Center for American Progress, um, where I was a speechwriter for, for John Podesta. And I, I you know, we were, Susan and I were talking before him. We're like, is politics funny? <laughs> um, but I guess we're going to find out. I, um, but I think what, Particularly, I think when I was on the Hill, you know, so the Center for American Progress was like sort of something different, but when I was on the Hill, what struck me as funny was just like how, how screwed up our, I mean, this is, this is not news, but how screwed up our elected officials are, like just as, just as much as we are, right? As well as the people who are, um, who are working for them. And so, like, all of the pomp and the circumstance I, was just sort of a, a, a trick of smoke and mirrors, right? And so, and so watching them all kind of fumble around, like, that's, that's funny, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think that, like, Veep, for example, like, gets, a, gets right on the head with that. Mm -hmm. Is it more Selena Meyer or more C.J. Craig? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think more Selena Meyer. <laughs> How about you? Um, Susan, you're the token Washingtonian here who lives here full time. <laughs> well, I think as Grant... Defend the town. <laughs> Defend the town. Well, it's a very funny town, so that's one good thing. Um, you know, I think playing off what Grant said, it's, it's the dysfunction that becomes funny. Politics on the face of it is quite dry and not that entertaining. It's when, to me, comedy begins to emerge when things become bad or dark, and I tend to write dark comedy and you just kind of get to that intersection where things are so bad, so absurd, that it either becomes funny or you need humor as a way to process it. You bring up a good point. I'll pivot to you, Sochi. Do you think um, us making fun of politics or Washington or any kind of politics, we're hoping for an alternate reality of maybe we're hoping that's what life could really be? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think a lot of what I do is I was trying to think about what about it with politics was funny is the satirizing of the performance of it all and I think something that whether consciously or subconsciously I was trying to highlight was how it's become so distant from actually what policy is <laughs> like it's like well how can I spin this and get a media moment out of this thing or how is this like we're going to like this event is now going to be the number one political event for one week and like right like and we're going to make everything about this and it's an emergency until we forget about it and the ratings drop and so I think that um, the hope is that we could actually have it return back to being about substance and humans and not about like media hits and getting on CNN and how did this performance go and like what's my photo up like I think that that is a little bit of what I was hoping to strip away and that actually there's you know under the humor these are real people's lives yeah speaking of real people um, all three of your books are all grounded on the drama of family whether it's your blood family or your work family in Susan's case um, why do you think um, that's very important, to keep the heart in the books, to keep it grounded and um, just authentically funny. Well, I think as Sochal said, like at the, at the root of all of this are real people, right? And that's sort of where this, this divorce is happening between the performance of politics and how those politics are affecting real people. And I think that, you know, there's, there's 
for, I think for, for most of us, there's, there's nothing as, as visceral and as real as a family. And for me, I'm, I'm really interested in the ways, particularly within the family unit, the imperfect ways we love one another and how even though we betray one another, we disappoint one another, we are, that doesn't absolve us from the obligation to continue loving one another. Um, and that itself is a political act, right? It's a, it, there's a transfer of power, there's a negotiation that goes on there. And so when I was writing Let's Not Do That Again, that parallel between what is this, this political family, how are they navigating their interpersonal dramas under the limelight of this, this very public campaign where there are very public dramas, um, that intersection was very interesting to me. How about you, Susan? Yeah, I was gonna say it's all it's all politics, right? The family, family politics, <laughs> politics on a larger scale, workplace politics, which certainly there's probably <laughs> as much of that going on in any workplace. As and in full disclosure, the Susan works for Politics and Prose, our partner. <laughs> <laughs> not, not there, of course. We, it's a great work family. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you so chill. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm always amused by the roles that family members play and how, like you could go and just be like, oh my God, like go with your, in this case, with your brother to something. And you think he's just like totally like a weakling, can't stand up for himself, like doesn't like have any conviction. And people are like, he's gonna be, literally it's a line in the book, he's gonna be the Latino Obama. And like, and any like <laughs> eye roll, but that, that plays out at family functions. Like you're like, all of your ideas are like, oh, he's so handsome, he's so brilliant. And you're like, oh my God, like he can't even tie his own shoe and I just have to make him a doctor's appointment. <laughs> like, so I think I like the idea and like the inspiration behind the politician character in my book was, was I was to the point about people being real people. It's like, like AOC has like a, a votive candle with her face on it. But at the same time, I was like, I have a hard time that she never bickers with her fiance or that her mother doesn't nag her on the phone. And I think that the idea of taking people out of that like sort of deified position, particularly I think politicians of color are like set up to have to be something bigger than just their legislative job. And so I sort of thought the family was a great way to like pull at those like strings of the illusion, yeah. Um, in your book, um, you deal with a lot of serious subjects. Despite, you know, there's a lot of funny moments and light moments. You talk about uh, gentrification and uh, colonization in Puerto Rico. How did you um, easily blend the serious subject matter with the lighthearted moments. I think that I personally have a twisted brain and find lots of things absurd. <laughs> so I, you know, one of the things that I, I, he's sort of as an inspiration for the one of the villain characters, but was Steve Bannon and this idea of like deconstructing <laughs> the state. And it was like, and so I sort of had this idea of like, what if people just out of like, you know, hoops and giggles were like, I'm just gonna play around with the government and deconstruct the state and what would happen. And then I sort of was watching that actually start to happen in our own government. And on the one hand, it was disturbing. And on the other hand, it was so absurd that um, you can manipulate things so easily. I think that the humor sometimes comes in the, the fear that actually it's all quite fragile. Like the, the, de the democratic process and what our rights are and what who things mean and who has power is a little bit fragile. And like it was happened to just get exposed um, while like in real time, like in certain ways in terms of corruption, especially after Hurricane Maria, which is a part of the book. Um, so I think that sadly the humor came from the truth of it. <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. like <laughs> Grant, yours, uh, your book um, deals a lot with some major family drama in the middle of this um, political campaign. I mean, nothing tops political drama than family drama. I mean, um, <laughs> both um, stories could have been two separate books. <laughs> yeah. How were you able to put that all together? Well, like I said earlier, I mean, I think that the, I, my, I write family books, right? I wouldn't say that I necessarily write, write political novels. This is, in fact, my only novel that is overtly political. Um, and so in, in, in really, I think that the, the politics is just sort of a set piece for the ways in which um, this family drama plays out. So the, the, the family drama has always been the thing that it really interests me. But as, so as you were saying, like as I was crafting this story about, about this one particular family kind of in the limelight as they were dealing with their own personal dramas, the, the world around me was getting more and more absurd and I became really fixated on this question of, you know, I, I, I was watching this, this very fragile thing, American democracy, this was like in 2018, really start to crumble 
And I became fascinated by this question of, well, how far would I, a seemingly sane person, though that is up for debate, <laughs> how far would I go to protect this thing that I'm now realizing is, is not to be taken for granted? And how far would I how far would I bend my own personal ethics in light of some greater good um, as the world is becoming more and more kind of dangerously absurd? And so I decided to take that question and make this family face it. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a decision that the consequences of which are gonna haunt them for the rest of their lives. In, um, and so that's how I kind of melded those two things together with this central question, which was really plaguing, it continues to plague me um, over the past few years. Susan, for you, there's no politician in your book, but I get it set in Washington, DC. And it's set at a time during one of the darkest moments in the past five years during the, the events that happened in Charlottesville and how the, the employees of this bookstore dealt with it. And this was happening like in the background of what's happening in the bookstore. What was your process of trying to make sure it, nothing focused too much on the, on the serious, but kept it very focused on what was going on in the bookstore? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because I had set it against the backdrop of Charlottesville. It, you know, I started off just writing a comedy set in a bookstore really about a vacuum cleaner um, as the inspiration. <laughs> but it was, I, Charlottesville had happened around the time that I was writing this and I felt that I couldn't not ground it in that moment, which also was bookended by the solar eclipse. So it just seemed like a really kind of interesting 10 day period. Um, but uh, um, I'm losing my thread here. For <laughs> That's all right. Um, oh, but it was, yeah, it was too much in the background. And when my editor read the book, she pointed out that you couldn't really take an event as serious as Charlottesville and just have it as the backdrops. And she was absolutely right. So I wound up weaving it in more into the texture of the novel. Perfect. So. You mentioned your vacuum cleaner. All three of you have an <laughs> item that um, kind of is pivotal to your plot. <laughs> and so, you know, for most people, this will just be an item. But for you guys, they were just instant gems. <laughs> for Susan, it was the vacuum. So she'll, for your, yours were the napkins. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have plenty. You have a trash compactor, you have a sword, you have a carpet. Um, how did you identify things like this that could be turned into comedy gold? I never thought it wouldn't be about the napkins. I worked as a luxury wedding planner for like 13 years. Um, and I didn't want to make the character a wedding planner because I wanted to try and pretend like I make things up for a living. And so, but I realized that it was like the perfect opportunity to talk about class and the way in which we view service and service work. Um, without it being too polemic or heavy handed. And I had personally been summoned to many meetings about napkins in the course of my career. And I had worried and tested linen to see if it left lint or it didn't leave lint. So these were, these were really events based in, based in real life, ripped from the headlines and made into, made into fiction. But I, and then it was sort of a fun thing to think about if you were to take all these resentments, what I loved about Olga is like I wrote purposely a character that was far more resentful than I ever was, but like how would you get back at people? And it's like, I'm gonna steal these napkins. <laughs> like, and I'm gonna give them to my cousin. And like, <laughs> so like, I think like the idea that like they became this symbolic Robin Hood gesture of like robbing from the rich and giving to the quote unquote poor of your family <laughs> so that they can swab their laps in linen, <laughs> it was like nice. <laughs> Susan, what's up with the vacuum? Uh, well, a few things. First, I think vacuums are just inherently funny. And one of my favorite comic novels was um, Graham Greene's Our Man in Havana, which centers around a vacuum. So I already had that in the back of my mind. But the reason I wove a vacuum into this novel, I wasn't going to write this novel. I promised everyone at the bookstore I wasn't going to. And I had left the job, but I was still on the email uh, internal email distribution list. I kept asking them to take me off, but I remained on it for a while. And I'd read the end of day reports that the store manager sent around. And the vacuum cleaner was 
just always coming up in those reports and it was <laughs> frequently broken or you know there'd be a message like just kick it a few times before you plug it in or the, the hose is clogged um, and finally I thought I this is a novel it's <laughs> so that's where that came from with Grant, with you, we could focus either on the sword or the trash compactor, Bob. It's. I am going to focus. Think. I think that there's no way to focus on the trash compactor without sort of like giving yes. too much away. <laughs> uh, so I'll focus on the sword. Um, so when I started writing the novel, I um, or kind of in the middle of drafting it, I was reading like a ton of Agatha Christie, and I, I hadn't read a lot of Agatha Christie before. And like the pandemic had just started, we were in lockdown, and I I, I found this pleasure in. And I, I usually read fiction because I, I like to see sort of my world mirrored back. Right? I, see, I like to see myself represented in something, my feelings articulated in a way I've never felt them before. But with, with Agatha Christie, the pleasure I was finding was seeing these details that were seemingly inconsequential suddenly become consequential later on. And so I kind of melded that with the idea of Chekhov's gun, that principle of you know if there's a gun hanging or a rifle hanging on the wall in the first chapter, it's got to go off in chapter two or three. And, and the, 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 the sword, it's an antique German hunting sword from the 18th century, don't ask me. Um, I, I was like, okay, I, I, I wanna make this thing, this Chekhov's gun, I wanna make it absurd. The, the book operates kind of at an 11. And I, I, I thought, I knew how the book was gonna end and I, I thought it, it had to kind of operate the entire time at an 11 for this absurdity to work. I, I remember like some Goodreads reviewers, I remember like the ending could never make sense. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, there's a character writing a musical based on Joan Didion, <laughs> you know, called Hello to All That. Like, obviously this is not our world. Uh, and so, um, so I decided like it couldn't just be a gun, this item, it had to be, I was like, okay, so it'll be a sword. How do I make this more absurd? Oh. I know, I'll make it from 18th century Germany, and I'll put monkeys on the handle. <laughs> oh boy. Um, for all three of your books, there's, there's a strong female character. For Grant, for you, was Nancy Harrison, who, the woman who's running for Senate. Susan, yours is Sophie, the owner of the bookstore. You'd be great, glad it's not, it's not a mag, so we'd all think it was Brad from Politics. <laughs> Which is, was not, yes, so clearly. So for you, it's, um, it's Olga, and actually her mother. Yes. <laughs> um, are there any women, either in real life or in, in, any, in literary history, that you admire or kind of formed your characters from? Well, I'll talk to my therapist about this on Wednesday. My, my, my <laughs> definitely, I, I was, my mother was a political activist, and that was sort of the, the root. But I was also, though, very, very, I would watch the Nina Simone documentary mm. that had been on, I think, Netflix. And I connected a bunch of dots about just sort of like, um, it's a term that uh, it, it, I think a Puerto Rican journalist had used about it, which is kamikaze moms, like where the cause is bigger than anything else. And I just sort of found that idea of like, it's not that you don't have the capacity to love, you just have the capacity to love on one scale and maybe not on a smaller scale. And that was definitely the inspiration for Blanca, the mom, um, for sure. You know, and like, and Olga, I think, um, really like, I, I wanted to just sort of give body to a lot of Latina women that I know that are living in so many worlds, you know, like they're living in their home world and the world that they came from and then the world that they've been told to aspire to and trying to find their space in both. And so, um, but definitely Blanco is a mix of my mom and then just sort of studying political activists and, and as parents. Mm -hmm. And I was really intrigued because like there is a true figure that's in the book called uh, Ojero Rios and he had been, uh, you know, a machadero for fighting for revolution in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And, I just was like, what if he was, and he didn't see his kids for 15 years, he would send them audio recordings. And I was like, what if a mo woman did that? Like, what would people think? So it was kind of a composite of these different concepts, yeah. How about you, Susan? Is Sophie formed from someone or any other yeah, literary characters no, you love? I, I can't say that she was formed from anyone in particular. I think she's an amalgam of a lot of different people, including, just in my mind, the, the two women who founded the bookstore um, were women, and I had them in the back of my mind. 
Uh, she also does, even though you said I don't have any politicians in the book, I'm just thinking like they come through a lot in different ways. And at one point, somebody thinks she looks like Nancy Pelosi. So <laughs> I, I did not think of Nancy as I was writing it, but that's, that's what she looked like in my mind. But no, really just. I think in part, I, when I went to work at the store, I was a lot older than most of my colleagues, but I had the job of the younger character in the book, so I was, that was kind of me bifurcating myself into two characters. How about you, Grant? So every, be, be, people will ask me, like, is Nancy Harrison, is it, is it Nancy Pelosi, is it Hillary Clinton? <laughs> and, and it's similar to Susan's answer. It's, it, she's not. She's a pastiche, I think, of a, of a lot of um, a lot of different characters, a lot of different kind of types that I've seen. I also speak to my therapist how every book, every, <laughs> every woman in all of my books is my mother, but you know, um, thank God she's not here um, to hear that. But um, I, I, I did know setting out to write the book that she, that, that, the, the, that character, the politician was always gonna be a woman. Um, simply because I, the, the, this, I'm not saying anything new here, but I think women face just, you know, a, such an uphill battle really in any industry and politics is no different. And thinking back to the 2016 elections, I was constantly just appalled by the language that was used in the mainstream media even to, to, to talk about the Clinton campaign um, and the double standards that, that women and particularly mothers face um, when it comes to having any kind of career and any kind of ambition. And so, that, um, that tension I knew was something that I wanted to explore. All three of you, your books have big secrets in it. I don't want to give anything away. How fun was it writing that? Um, I know it's going to be kind of a struggle here for any of you who haven't read any of these books, try to describe not giving away any of these secrets. Oh. Was it fun or was it heartbreaking? I think um, I felt sad. It was, I guess it was like, fun to think about creative ways in which this person has gone to lengths to keep their secret. Like, and, and at the same time, then sometimes I would just heartbreak for the character because the person was rooted in what I know is a real life struggle for people. And so um, sometimes it would like, you know, the, the, dis, the disconnect of it. Um, I, when he finally comes to terms with the fact that his secret's no longer a secret, I felt sad for him like you know I heart my heart broke with his heart um, about all the things that he the machinations um, but it was it was fun to kind of think about the desperate things that a person will do to keep a secret to some extent yeah that happens a lot in your books Susan the desperation of trying to keep um, something coming out yes although the the secret is not so much a secret because I begin with the character wondering about the answer to a certain question, and I struggled with how to tell that in a narrative sense for so long that I finally decided to just bring it right up to the forefront so it's not really, it wouldn't be a huge spoiler for me to talk about it, but the, my character begins just wondering if this poet who's coming in to speak at the store, who's become very controversial, she wonders if that's her birth father. Mm -hmm. So that's what's being resolved through the book. It just made it easier to just get it out there rather than try to. It's no episode of Maury. Grant, <laughs> <laughs> no. yours um, has a couple secrets in there too, Pepper did. Yeah, so the secret, it's, a, I'm gonna kind of like, have two answers to this question, which is one, this, the, the sort, of, sort of the big secret that emerges was was really fun to come up with. Um, that that's going to make me sound like a crazy person once you read the book. Um, <laughs> but like coming up with that idea was really fun. But then I am like so bad at logistics. I am like not a detail oriented person. So for to then figure out like how this family logistically was going to try to keep this secret was a night like I had nightmares about it like I was like oh my god like you know like I don't even know where my keys are half the time like I don't know where my dog is half the time like how like how am I going to figure out how to do this in this book so untangling that was was stressful fun but stressful <laughs> speaking of stress um, it's been a you know rough couple years here um, between the pandemic and everything else, what got you guys through the pandemic? Um, were you able to, was it more like, I was able to finish this book because of it? Or what else? Um, did it inspire you? Did it scare you? What? 
I, I guess it relieved me of an anxiety of making excuses to get out of social obligations to write. <laughs> 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 I, I felt really let off the hook um, in a lot of ways, and I was really deep into doing, I, I, I just had sold the book right at the beginning of the pandemic, so I was deep into revisions and a couple of other projects, and so um, it was like, I didn't ever feel guilty, <laughs> I guess, so that's a very Catholic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a, a similar, my own version of that answer, which is first I was kind of relieved to not have to go anywhere and um, just be in, you know, be home for a year plus. So that part was enjoyable, but I was anxious in the opposite way because I was just trying to set, sell this book. And I was hearing, first my, I wrote a piece about this for Washingtonian, so I can say my agent, didn't uh, drop me after that, but I was uh, commenting on how I kept trying to call him and he wasn't answering my calls, but he's posting pictures of his dogs on Facebook. And, um, <laughs> and then when he did try to shop it, editors weren't really in the right frame of mind to be reading. So it just, I had this couple of years of thinking I'm never going to publish this book. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was a nice, nice to just retreat for a bit. I, you know, it, it's, it, it was, a, kind of an escape, like the, the book was. I, the book is set in, in both New York and Paris, and it's, it's very, very grounded in those two places. Um, and I was in the middle of drafting it when, when everything shut down. And so I did look at it as, a, as sort of a, a, a world to escape into. And I was writing about these like, very, these, like my favorite bars in New York. And, and so it was fun being able to kind of like think I was also like longing for them. And so this helped. Um, I will say my, my, my husband and I, you know, we live in a, a small New York apartment and he was obviously, you know, he, his office was closed and so he was home working. And as someone who like works from home a lot, I was like, I'll tell you how to do it. You gotta, you gotta wake up, you gotta shower in the morning, you gotta just treat, you know, you gotta go to the desk, you gotta treat it like your job. And like, he was like, all right. And so he would do that. And then he'd be like, how many days has it been since you've showered? <laughs> I'd be like, four, four days, four days. Uh, but I'm a writer, so it's different. Uh, but, but that dynamic was kind of interesting, like trying to carve out space, right? Like physical space when you have someone else there with you was, um, was, was a challenge, as we all know. Is anything from the pandemic or the past several years, I'd say for the past five years, inspire you for future books or future short stories or anything? Yeah, I, you know. I mean, know. there's a lot of comedy that's happened in the past couple of years. A lot of, you know, sad stuff too, but. Yeah, you know what? I think it gave me a lot of time to like reflect. And so, um, and I think, I think it's been an interesting time to just really see the different generational attitudes towards things. Like I, I, you know, I'm pretty firmly in Gen X and it's been interesting to just see, um, the, you know, younger people's take and what that makes me question about my own take. And so I think that in this time of watching that, um, my, my, my next book in part is a campus novel set in the 90s because I, it made me realize how much has changed about the way that we like that institutions think about educating students in terms of diversity and breadth of opinion and also how students think about being at an institution and what that does so but in a fun way you know in like a fun way like i don't know i was like no i'm not with a lot of fun like, but yeah, fun. um i think that 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 the time seeing so much happen and seeing people have such deep emotions and reactions to things but then also how nuanced and different they are like based on your relation to technology to media to growing up like with where feminism was always existent like you know it's it's been really interesting so it gave me a lot of time to mold these things i think um in a way that's shaped new curiosities yeah yeah that's an interesting question because i tend to turn almost anything into comedy, but I think enough time needs to pass between uh, before that happens. So I haven't really thought about, I'm not sure that I ever will think about the comic possibilities of that, but I am writing a novel that's set now and I'm facing the dilemma of what to do with the remnants of the virus. And you know, I, I mm -hmm. just the idea that there's just like face masks littering the street mm -hmm. or uh, one character appears wearing a mask when it's largely over and just how, how to incorporate that into the book has been interesting. How about you, Grant? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I'm also writing a book right now that's set in the, in the 90s um, in, in Laguna Beach where I grew up. Um, and it's, it's entirely first person, which is something I haven't done in a very long time, um, which is like a fun, unique challenge. Uh, but it, 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 the, the narrator is, is, is 15. Um, and I think what the pandemic did, you know, kind of the more I think about it, is that the, let's not do that again, is it deals with obviously the interpersonal dramas of this family, but also these sort of large scale political global problems. Um, and I think kind of just in my own life, just being having, dealing with that kind of day in and day out for the past however many years, it's made me like intensely interested in this period of my life, of, of one's life, you know, adolescent, adolescence where, where the dramas kind of taken out of adolescence are actually quite small when I look back, right? Like, oh, the problems I was having with my friends are, are kind of very small, but felt so monumental um, and felt, in fact, larger than a pandemic mm -hmm. at the time. And so trying to kind of capture that feeling of what, does, what a pandemic feels like now, like, in, and then bottling it into adolescence in the 90s um, and kind of turning inward with that, um, I think is how it's manifested itself for me. Cool. So um, all three of your books read like it could be either turned into a movie or, or limited. Um, um, series on HBO Max or Netflix. Um, Grant, I know your last book, The People We Hate at the Weddings, is coming out. It has Allison Jenny, Kristen Bell, and Ben Platt starring in that film. Congratulations. <laughs> Who would you star in this, in your new book? Well, it's funny. So I was, I was fortunate enough to actually visit the set of People We Hate at the Wedding um, when they were filming it last, last October. And the, the, the leads in that, like the, lead, the main characters in that, are sort of like age-wise the same as the main characters in this book. And so now whenever I write a book, I just cast Alice and Janney, Kristen Bell, <laughs> and, Pratt, and, <laughs> and so, which like, you know, probably something else to talk about with my therapist. But, um, <laughs> but so I'm like, oh, Alice and Janney, she would be great if Alice and Janney would be great in everything, right? And so, uh, I don't know. It's like con it kind of constantly changes. It, it basically changes on whatever TV show I'm watching at that moment. Uh -huh. um, you know, I like I love I loved Yellow Jackets, for example. So I'm like cast Melanie Linsky in everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it changes very rapidly. Julian Moore, maybe. Oh, she would be fantastic. <laughs> sure, I, I, I'll I mean, cast them all for you. What it. if I was like, no, I don't think Julianne would be right. <laughs> no, no, just, yes, no, obviously Julianne Moore. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Susan? You know, in my head, you don't have to agree with me. It was Frances McDermott. Oh, well, sure, that would be fantastic, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, I don't think about that when I'm writing or even when I'm finished because maybe that will jinx the reality of that happening. Oh, come on. But, <laughs> well, but, but there was a but. Um, the one book that I had turned into a television movie starred Joan Cusack, and oh, I could imagine amazing. her. I would love amazing. for her to, to be in this. How about you, Sojo? I'm in the midst of a long and arduous journey of adaptation, but <laughs> my dream cast has come together. I'm not sure if we'll be able to hold them because of time and other commitments, but Aubrey Plaza was attached to play Olga. Ramon Rodriguez was attached to play Prieto. Jesse Williams, um, Mateo, um, Jeremy Mulroney as Dick. So I am hoping in a, the next iteration time will allow us to keep this group together because they were uh, the amazing Jessica Mandel was Mabel so it was just really um, so fingers crossed and yeah <laughs> we are going to take questions from the audience there are two microphones here on both of the aisles here so if you have a question come on up and I'll ask it once I see you anyway um, Grant, I know you had you told Good Morning America a funny story that you were apologizing to everyone who was on the set. Oh, so I, I I'm so lame, like crushingly lame. I um, so I, I've never been on a movie set before, right? And that they were filming about two hours outside of London, and they sent a driver to pick me up at my hotel, and it was really early, like it was a whole day, but it was a really early day, and I don't know what I thought if it was just going to be like one person with a camcorder and like Alice <laughs> and Danny, like I don't know what I was thinking, but I showed up, and there's like you know, it's like a city they've built out of trailers and so and again it was really early in the morning and 
this, something else I can talk about with my therapist, I just started apologizing <laughs> to everyone for like being the reason that they had to get up so early. <laughs> I, I, like everyone I went up to, I was like, I am so sorry. It is so early. And they were like, who is this guy? Like, get him out of here, you know? And so, yeah, they were like, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, I was just, I was so apologetic. <laughs> Without giving, you know, or disparaging any of the studios you're all working with, how were your experiences working with any of your adaptations? Or your planning for it? I mean, the process was great. I think it's the, you know, it's a challenge. I, I, I'll just be very honest. It's a challenge. Um, there's, a, there's, I think, 18% oh, Latino people in America, and there's like 0.1% television representation. So, you know, it's a challenge when people don't necessarily understand the community to convey um, that you're getting an accurate representation. And when you're communicating, you know, the only uh, industry that apparently is actually the entertainment industry executive landscape is uh, the C-suite is wider than oil and gas. It's something like 92% um, completely white and mainly males. So, you know, you're trying to communicate a culture to people that don't understand or have any exposure to your culture. So it's a like that's a challenge, but the onset experience was amazing. Like the creatives, like the the set designers, the costume people, like the crew, everybody was so excited. And so I know that we'll capture that again. But it's like I recognize it's a slightly uphill battle. Um, but I'm forging ahead. <laughs> How about you, Susan? I was very uninvolved in the process. I was advised to not work on the scripts, and that was fine with me. I thought they did a better job than I would have been able to. I was too close to it to see the other possibilities, but uh, I, I was given the final, to, final script to as a consultant, um, so I was able to make some suggestions, which they didn't take. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I didn't go down to see it being filmed, and they were kind of discouraging me from coming down. I think they filmed it in Louisiana, and later one of the producers told me there was just a lot of drama on the set. So I think they just didn't want any extra people there. So if I have uh, the good fortune to do that again, I will take more advantage of it. We have a question here. My question is for um, Suzanne. So I work in a bookstore right now, um, and so I totally get about the vacuum. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering if there were any like specific experiences from working on politics and prose that kind of like inspired you to write about a bookstore or, or that you used when you were writing. Where, where do you work? Um, I work at Eleanor's Norfolk um, in Norfolk, Virginia, right by Virginia Beach. So uh, everyone uh, should come. <laughs> we should applaud all independent bookstores yes. when we're talking about this right now. We're turning one year old this year um, in a couple days. So, yeah. um, well, that's great. Yeah, I think some of what I wanted to capture were were the things that hadn't occurred to me before working in a bookstore because everybody just thinks that it's such a, a lovely, sweet <laughs> job. In fact, somebody I knew in Washington came in once and saw me working there and said, that's so cute. <laughs> and I thought, you know, <laughs> it's really a very challenging, very physical job. And I think in part the physicality of that job is part of part of what I wanted to capture, but also just the daily. I mean, I love all workplace novels, including you know I enjoyed both of your novels because they are both workplace novels. So to just kind of capture the daily rhythms of what goes on in, in on in a bookstore, but also I work in events. I still work in events, so the world of author events is its own sort of subgenre that is very funny, can be very stressful, and can be very funny. So. Yeah. so I know politics is all about human behavior, and so there's all different, everything is politics. But on the national scale, the politics isn't really funny now, because there's so much at stake. So I'm wondering, for all of you, is anything off limits? I know, everybody I know thought the producers in Springtime for Hitler was a riot, except me. Mm -hmm. And it probably is funny. I just couldn't get past the Hitler thing. Is anything open for comedy? Well, I, I would say that if you look at it as a release, then yes. I mean, there was an article about bomb shelters uh, becoming comedy clubs in Ukraine. I think 
people need comedy as a way to process and release. So yeah, there's very dark topics. Um, you know, the Holocaust is not funny, and yet sort of turning that into humor helps us process it. I, I would just add on, like, I think about, you know, let's say a show like Orange is the New Black, and there's like, what can be more limiting or like debilitating than having, you know, being incarcerated, having your freedom taken away from you, and yet there's so much organic humor that comes from just, because we are humans, I think our nature is to laugh, to find things absurd, even in the darkest of circumstances. So I don't know that I would set out to satirize anything just to be controversial. But if, like, in thinking about something I find a humorous take, I wouldn't shy away from it. I agree. I think that there, I mean, there are certainly things that I would not feel comfortable satirizing or that, like, a comedy that I wouldn't truck in. But I think, kind of, going off what we were saying, Susan, I think that there's, it's a form of processing and a form of release and a form of psychological coping. Um, and so that, that's how I look at it, sort of, in, in, as, as a mode of communication. Um, and so while there are things that I certainly would not touch, because um, I don't think that they're funny, um, I don't know if I would say every, there is something that's off limits. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. I'll make a pitch for Susan's novel year class at the Writers' Center in Bethesda. <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted, as I began reading your book, came the shocking news when Salman Rashdie was uh, stabbed mm -hmm. at Chautauqua. And I couldn't help but think about your themes about the bookstore wrestling with you know, whether to invite this uh, writer and, and security issues and all. And I think it was when you were doing some of your book signings. So. Um, maybe you could reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. In fact, I just, I rarely go back and, and look at my books once they're finished, but I know I was looking for a scene to read and noticed I had talked about Salman Rushdie and Midnight's Children. That comes up early in the book. Um, yeah, in the book I have this happening that they, they're getting security in for a controversial event and I started working there 11 years ago, and that was, you know, a periodic concern. And as we've just seen with Salman Rushdie, it's, um, you know, that's still a concern. And I don't have anything wise to say about that other than it's, you know, horrible times. None of you are stand-up comics, clearly, or comedians. Oh. Oh. Clearly. Um, <laughs> after, um, <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> but, you know, after, um, you know, um, the Oscars, um, everything that happens on social media, does that make you more careful of what you write and mm. what topics you touch? And, or, I, I hate to say make fun of, but, you know. So, I just, I also write, I have a newsletter for The Atlantic, and I wrote, just wrote a piece that was in the print issue about um, noise and the gentrification of quiet, and... I, I didn't think it was going to be controversial, and what I decided after that, apparently it was very controversial, but what I decided after that was that I just was not going to, I'll engage with conversations with people, like I got to, you know, I did NPR and I did Collins and had civil conversation, but I, I won't engage with social media about it, if that makes sense. So I don't want to censor myself because of fear, but I won't engage in subpar conversation that's not actual interrogation of the idea. Mm -hmm. Like I, so I think that that is, I'm not going to devi define my, my art down because the nature of the conversation is so base online. And, um, and so that, I, I think that that's the best way to answer it. It taught me a good lesson that is not to retreat, but is to lean in and just ignore people that aren't, I put a lot of energy into my, thoughts and ideas if I'm going to put them into paper. And if I'm not going to be met with that same level of intellectual rigor in a conversation back, then why pay attention to it? Yeah, I completely <laughs> agree. I think that there's, there's such a difference between, as you were saying, intellectually interrogating an idea and rigorously kind of looking at rhetoric and, 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 and parsing something apart and the sort of reactionary hot takes that have become popular on places like Twitter. And so, I agree. Like, I, and I think that it's actually like engaging, engaging in that kind of reactionary hot take ends up making me feel dumber. Yes. And like, I forget how to interrogate an idea. 
which becomes problem. I, I teach at NYU, and I teach, I teach essay writing at NYU, and I'm constantly asking my students to interrogate an idea as opposed to sort of just reacting to it. Um, and I find myself getting more reactionary, right, the longer I'm like scrolling through Twitter. And so I think that kind of putting rules down and saying like, I will, I will engage in a conversation or a debate about an idea, but not one that is limited to 140 characters and a series of back and forth. And, and by the way, people will get upset about anything. I wrote a piece about how we need a rat czar in New York, and I thought it was so <laughs> clearly a comedic piece. And it was like, I was getting like hate mail, like, like hate tweets that were like, no, crime. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and also rats. <laughs> Don't worry, I just saw a rat here in the convention center. <laughs> Susan? Yeah, it, it can be paralyzing if you pay too much attention to that. And even with this book, you know, there's still little pockets of topics that I've touched that I'm still waiting for somebody to attack me for. And, you know, we see that all the time with authors with, you know, just something comes up and is misinterpreted and it's people are so quick to just attack somebody on Twitter and, and I stay off Twitter other than to retweet or advertise an event so I'm, I'm afraid of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hi, um, not super related to social media but I was wondering um, when you guys were first writing your first novels um, I guess what was the most challenging and maybe what like what you didn't expect to be the, the most challenging? Hmm, that's a good question. So, considering yeah. this is your debut novel. Yeah, I, I, yes. So, the most, what was sort of the uh, challenging, but then I realized quite quickly that it was going to be challenging, was managing all the plot threads, if that makes sense. And so, um, but the former wedding planner in me was very good at detail and, <laughs> and organizing them. The thing that was more surprising was you get really into this thing, and then all of a sudden you realize, like, you wrote some convenient lies that people are feeling about things. And like, you know, you look at a scene with two characters and you're like, is that really what she's, like if, if all of these things had happened, like to be as emotionally honest as you follow the through line of the plot versus what you want to happen. And I think that going back and having to really interrogate all of that and question it was the more, ch and, and then force yourself to think through these feelings and have these feelings was the more challenging part. Yeah, I think I'd say the, the more, most challenging part was the publishing piece. I was probably too naive. I was very young. I was too young to be trying to write a novel, but nevertheless, I, I finished the first novel and tried to sell it and spent a year or two of heartbreak and then set it aside and said, you know, I'm going to take, I, I try to be glass half full person. I'm going to take everything I learned from that process and, the, you know, incorporate the positive things people said and put everything I have into the second novel. And if I can't sell that, I'm going back to school and getting a master's in history. So um, that was the challenge for me. And it, it's just as well that it never published it. Um, I wish I hadn't published my first novel. <laughs> I, I think that the hardest thing for me, and it, it actually took me three books to learn it, was writing the story that I wanted to tell, the story that I felt like I needed to tell, as opposed to the story or the book that I should be mm. telling, or that like fit at this moment in my career or with this sort of slice of my identity, like, and just kind of getting rid of all of that and writing the story that, that truly interested me and felt urgent. Um, but like I said, that certainly didn't happen with the first book, and it, it took me until I, I, the people we hate at the wedding um, to kind of land there. Thank you all so much. Um, if you had to write a, like a historical fiction and pick a moment in history that you think that you could spin into something funny, what would that be? There's a lot of I can answer in the past that. I'll, so, I'll answer yeah. it and give you both time to think. Thanks. Uh, because I did do <laughs> that. And so the second novel that became my debut novel, I thought I was writing a historical novel about a very tragic character, which was Eleanor Marx, Karl Marx's daughter, mm -hmm. who had committed suicide. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, there, there's a novel uh, here. 
And then when I wrote it and went to try to sell it again, everybody said, this is very funny. And I thought, how, how in the world is this funny? Um, I didn't really mean to make a comedy out of something tragic. So uh, that, it, the comedy was not really about her. It was everything else going on in the novel. Please, Ojo. I think there could be a lot of comedy in the Spanish-American War. <laughs> I do. I think like, like I think the idea of borders is just sort of like hilarious. It's like like one day like you're American now. Like and I just sort of think like like that is really like a hilarious idea. There's a, a hilarious comedy to be made in the very first census, census taken in Puerto Rico where people were like, I don't want your racism and just were identifying as white even though nobody was. Like, you know, like I think that stuff is kind of really hilarious. Like, so um, I, the idea of um, imposed identity, I find kind of hilarious. And even though there's some tragic consequences and just, um, you know, the absurdness of like, one day you're one thing and then a line is drawn on a map and now you're supposed to be something else. And what does that mean? Yeah. Grant. I think that there's a lot of, like, like a ton of comedy to be found in the French Revolution. Like, <laughs> yes. it, it's just, I mean, like, we have like our, like these visions of it of like, I mean, obviously it was like terrible and bloody, but, and I think I'm thinking of this right now because I, earlier today I saw on Twitter, someone had posted, a, a, it was like a, a nonfiction, like it looked like a very kind of like academic biography of Robespierre, but the, the person writing the tweet was like, oh my God, this book has everything, like historical <laughs> intrigue, like, ro like, 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 you know, like a, like a, a, a romantic triangle, right? like everything. And I was like, this is hilarious. And like the cover is like a very staid portrait of Robespierre. Um, and so, but then also I started thinking about it and I was like, they made up their own months. Like that's hilarious. Like that is it's hilarious, hilarious <laughs> right? Like there's a, there was a tennis court involved, right? Like, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that I, you know, maybe that'll be my next book. <laughs> it's Robespierre, a comedy. No, I'm Hi, I wanted to ask about how you think about the audience, or if you think about the audience as you're writing, uh, related to either reactions or things you're trying to, you know, signal or honor for a particular community group, or like I, as an artist, like how constrained do you feel to represent something bigger than yourself or drive some message to a particular audience or um, are waiting for some kind of audience reaction once you finish? In the first draft, I, the, I think the only level at which I'm thinking about the audience is like, does, how do I, like, does this make sense? Like, is this, can, would someone be able to follow plot-wise sort of what's happening here? But I try not to think about the audience. I try, at least in the very first draft, because I look at most of the novels that I'm writing as trying to work something out, right? There's like a problem that I'm trying to work out, um, not a problem that has a definitive solution by the end of the novel, certainly, but, but there's, there's something that interests me, and so it's a very personal thing. Um, so I try not to be constrained too much by thinking about an audience. Yeah, I think I should think about the audience more and I would be more successful <laughs> because <laughs> I just tend to write very dark comedy and even with this book with this, you know, colorful, happy cover, it's, there's a lot of darkness running through that and um, people don't always expect or appreciate that. Um, I think I was really driven to write. I'm like, oh my God, one day I will get on a stage and not encant Toni Morrison, but you know, the, the, write the book that you want to read. And I just had not seen an experience like mine, which was, you know, both as like a New Yorkan, but also as a New Yorkan whose community is being displaced and, um, you know, working class family. And I just hadn't seen that and particularly you know, not as a young girl, you know, like, and I felt really determined from the very outset that if somebody with a similar background to me read it, they would be like, yes, like, yes, like, and because I felt I hadn't seen that walk of life validated um, on the page. And so I think my, I've always 
found this to be true just in my business life, niche often works. Like you play niche and people are very into it. And I think I wrote it very specifically for a particular audience. And it happens to be that then in the specificity, there's a universality and that's, you know, a beautiful thing. But I very much wrote for, a, 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 I wrote for that New York woman really. Yes, ma'am. I was really struck by Zoshizil's comment that borders are really hilarious. And I wondered if you could expand on that a bit and if you've explored it more in any of your books and what you think the implications of a you know, borderless world might be. Yeah, you know, probably taking on a borderless world might be more than I can do in this seat at this moment. But, <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, I guess I do think a lot, like the next, one of the, there's two heroines in my next book and one, um, is a Cubana who was, came to America on Operation Peter Pan, for instance, and she sort of picked up, literally put on a plane, dropped in Iowa, and now told she's an American. And I think I am attracted to these ideas of like, and in Puerto Rico, for instance, you know, it was like there was a war, where it was a Spanish colony for like three days, it was an independent land, and then suddenly there was like a house, like a wife swap, and it's like, oh yeah, you belong to America. <laughs> and like, you know, like, and I think the idea that this is arbitrary, but that suddenly everybody still has the name American and is meant to feel a particular way, I, I find it slightly absurd and interesting. You know what I mean? Like, and so I don't know I, that, I don't know that I've extrapolated it to a borderless, world and I, I, I traveled a lot in the last year and I do feel like every state seems to have its own personality and persona so it's not that I think it's completely absurd as much as the notion of shifting and moving is is funny to me that like it comes with an identity that um, I don't think automatically kicks in thank you <laughs> well you'll be our last question ma'am uh, so as the daughter of a Mexican immigrant who doesn't speak Spanish, never been to Mexico, um, in Olga Dice Dreaming, I noticed that there were different characters, different characters who connected with their identity in different ways. You had the non-Puerto Rican who knew everything about Puerto Rico. <laughs> you had the Puerto Rican who didn't speak Spanish and had only visited once, and then you know, the one who's learning Spanish and visited quite frequently. How did you manage? characters who identified with their roots yeah. in different ways without making one seem more valid or more important than the other person's connection? Yeah. Oh, I love that question. And I'd say it was from genuine belief and it was from the knowledge that it's like circumstance. You know, I think, um, especially amongst Latinos, we're made to feel really ashamed that we don't speak Spanish and nobody attributes the fact that forced assimilation of racism is largely the reason why that is and that our families want us to fit in and don't want us to be discriminated against. And so I, I, I think because I have sympathy to that and that that's the reason why my Spanish is so pathetic, like, but at the same time, like my mother speaks completely fluent Spanish and like my mother speaks completely fluent Spanish, her, her sisters did, like her sister didn't. And I just think the relationship to language and that, um, you know, Olga, the heroine, she sort of goes off to a private elite school and like where these things, the process of assimilation is somewhat rewarded and her brother is able to go to like a state school and he joins a Latino fraternity and like the idea of like embracing that identity is more celebrated and I, I think both experiences are valid and that's probably the reason why that came across in the art. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all three of you, Oshiel, Susan, and Grant. This was fantastic. I'm hoping we answered the question that politics is funny uh, when you watch the news tonight. So they'll be signing books downstairs on the expo floor. Thank you again for coming to the, uh, to the book festival. We'll see you next year.